Well, welcome to another episode of Why I Believe on the Facebook site, My Road to Hope and Peace. We appreciate you uh, bearing with us for a little bit while we had some technical difficulty. We are your hosts, James and Jody Evanson, and we are very grateful to have, to have you join us here tonight. Our special guests are Peter and Donna, Donna Vidmar. We are so privileged to have them with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Peter Vidmar is a three-time Olympic medal winning gymnast former television and radio sports analyst and professional corporate speaker. He is famous for achieving a perfect score on the pommel horse that won him the gold medal in the 1984 Olympics. He served as chairman of the U.S. Gymnastics Board of Directors and represented U.S. Olympians in the 2012 Olympics. He is a member of the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame and International Gymnastics Hall of Fame. He and his wife, Donna, have five children. A reminder that tonight's broadcast is live, and you are welcome to put any questions you might want to ask Peter and Donna in the chat uh, function of the Why I Believe Live uh, broadcast. Yeah, thank you for being patient. Yeah, thank you for being patient. While we got this started. Today. It's great to be on. Thank you for thank being here. Well, let's start with uh, maybe just telling us a little bit about the two of you, how you met, and um, just your family and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Well, we met um, at UCLA. We were both gymnasts on the gymnastics team at UCLA. And um, I'm a year older than him, and so I was a freshman on the gymnastics team when he was a senior in high school. And he used to come to the gym, and we used to look at all the boys on the other side of the gym because he worked out together. And, and they'd say who they all were, and I'm like, who's that guy in there? Like, oh, that's just Peter and Ben in high school. It's like, oh. <laughs> but I thought he was cute. And then, then the next year he signed at UCLA and so we started going to school together and then about a year or so later um, I made it known that I wanted him to ask me out and he never did and um, so finally we were at a function at the dorms and I won a, a dinner for two at Benihana's of Tokyo which is a little uh, Japanese Japanese restaurant and, um, and that night the whole night I kept saying, I'm over this guy. I didn't even start dating him, but I'm over him. And he, I was ignoring him, and he followed me around the whole night. And then when I won the door prize, he kept telling me how much he loved Benny Hanna's of Tokyo. But he'd never been. And he'd never been, <laughs> but he told me he did. And so the next day, I asked him out on our first date. And then the rest is history. But that's how we met. And so I was a freshman, and she was a sophomore at UCLA. We we saw each other every day in the gym because the men's gymnastics team and the women's gymnastics team were in the same facility and we worked out together essentially so um and yeah that's how we how we met sort of dating and um to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. we have five kids and almost we have seven grandkids with two on the way so almost nine grandchildren yeah, that's that's so fun so you asked him out I asked yeah, I, I was real, I mean, I, I was a gymnast. I didn't have much of a social life. I <laughs> was focused on my training and I, you know, I, I, I was attracted to her, I liked her, but I was scared to death of, you know, asking someone out on a date because I was just so inexperienced. I was just training gymnastics and stuff, but it worked out. Yes, it tell, us, tell us the love story. How long did it until you then got married and how did from first date to well, you know, and I, and I was born and raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's so, um, so I would disappear on Sundays and go back to my home ward, which wasn't too far away from campus. So I didn't even have my records at the UCLA ward. Um, and she... And I didn't, I did not know what a Mormon was or a minister, or I never heard of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in my life. But I found out that's where he would disappear on Sundays. And so I went to the library at UCLA back before Google and anything, and I and I read the Joseph Smith story out of an encyclopedia, and oh. thought, okay, this guy's a little crazy, you know, <laughs> a little funny story, I don't know. And then, um, but it got me thinking about religion, and where I, you know, I grew up uh, in another faith, but we stopped going to church when I was about eight, and um, and at the time I had roommates of three other faiths. And, and then him, and then me, and I started questioning everybody in all the different faiths and what was with the faith that I grew up in, and um, then I met missionaries, 
had awesome, amazing missionaries that were perfect for me, and um, and I ended up joining the church a year or so later, and and then a couple, of, I guess three and a half years after we met, we got married. Mm -hmm. We were in Los Angeles, Los Angeles Temple, Angeles Temple. Mm -hmm. and uh, so that's our that's kind of how our lives got together. So it's uh, it's interesting because in terms of the faith journey, for example. Uh, um, my roots in, in this church go back to the original founding of the church. My great-great-great-grandfather, Solomon Chamberlain, we, through our family history research, we figured he was in the room when the church was organized. He crossed the plains with Brigham Young, um, and uh, so I have this rich history on my father's side. My mother's a convert to the church, just like my wife is, um, but... Uh, but Independent of that, I think that um, there has to come a time when we own our own testimonies, our own beliefs. And so as, uh, and I was always a faithful member of the church when I was going to school there and when I met her. And as she, uh, as Donna was taking the and, and lessons from the missionaries, as she was listening to them, I could feel my testimony de developed at a different level because I had to ask myself, is this, is this my faith, or am I just inheriting my parents' faith? And so, having gone through that, then I, I felt I felt that that faith grow at a much deeper level. Um, and so, I'm grateful for the whole experience, really, of having met her uh, when she was not a member of our church, and then going through this conversion process, really, together with her. Um, it had always been my belief. But now it was strengthened through that experience, and I'm grateful for that. Very grateful for that. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So did you did you end up going serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ? I, I, I didn't, and so I um, and it was a struggle. I'd fallen in love with this wonderful young woman, and I, uh, I I I I knew that missionary work was important, and serving a mission would be important, and so I had to kind of as my testimony grew. I mean, so it became mine all of a sudden now I had to make some choices. Um, I had not received my patriarchal blessing. It's a blessing that we, um, as members of the church, can receive from someone um, who we believe is inspired to give us counsel and guidance that comes from the Lord specifically to us. And so I, I fasted and I prayed um, to the Lord that I would, uh, with a commitment, that I would do whatever um, I, uh, I needed to do, and that, it, and in my blessing, whatever direction and instruction I received, God would go. And so I was ready. I mean, I was when I met with this wonderful, faithful uh, patriarch that was going to give me a blessing. My knuckles were cracked. I thought, okay, tomorrow I'm going to walk into my coach who's been coaching me for ten years, and say, you know, change plans. Um, I need to, I need to take off for a while. Um, but that wasn't the answer I received, and uh, it said it was very specific about my gymnastics and about my opportunity to serve a mission with my wife. Um, when my children were grown, I thought, well, that's interesting. And lo and behold, uh, you know, a few decades later, um, my wife and I were called, as you have been called, to preside over a mission for the church in Australia. And it was a great, wonderful, life-changing experience. It was terrific. So, yeah. so now tell us, how did you get involved in the world of gymnastics? You know, we kind of we kind of got in the same way. We well, we I went just school. because mine was um, my mom worked at our high at the local high school, and the Scats gymnastics team came and did an exhibition, and I'd never seen anything like that before in my life, and I just watched it and came home and said, "I want to do that." And how old were you? I was probably in like third or fourth grade, mm -hmm. and then so which is really late in today's day and age for gymnasts, but. Um, and I did it the whole time, and then I got my scholarship to go to UCLA. I competed at UCLA, and that was the end of my career there. So. And mine was the same way, except mine, interestingly enough, my, my exposure to gymnastics originally came through my father, who loved doing gymnastics and competed for his high school team in the 1930s in Los Angeles. My father used to hang out at a place called Muscle Beach down by the Santa Monica Pier. Um, if there's any older folks watching this um, webcast, um, uh, Jack LaLanne got his start there at that Muscle Beach. Joe Gold of Gold's Gym got his start at Muscle Beach. And my dad was not one of the famous ones, but he loved doing it. But when my father was 27, which was well before I was born, he contracted polio. And as a result, uh, had some 
pretty severe physical limitations uh, for the rest of his life, and that's how I knew my father. But he loved watching the sport, loved watching it on television, and I'd sit down there and watch it with him. And, and then um, the, the local high school in Westchester, California, right near the LA airport, um, put on a little exhibition in the cultural hall of our church mm -hmm. in Los Angeles because the state president's son was on the gymnastics team. And so he had put together this little exhibition and my dad brought me down there to watch it. And I thought it was just like Donna said, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I said, Dad, I gotta become a gymnast. And didn't really have very many opportunities, but at the age of 11, uh, Makoto Sakamoto, who was the USA's best gymnast in the 60s and early 70s, had just retired from competing at the Munich Olympic Games in 1972. Put an article out, you know, an advertisement saying he wanted to start coaching gymnastics and had a little program run through the Culver City Department of Parks and Recreation. And my dad saw the article and I went and tried out. And I stayed with that, that man, Makoto Sakamoto, for my entire career. He's an incredible teacher, incredible mentor to me. Um, I'm still very close to him. And, um, you know, that, so my father's influence, seeing my father struggle with, uh, with the, the effects of his polio and never complaining, um, and then having a coach that, that had been there to the Olympic Games and had, had seen what it was all about and could share those experiences, um, those two individuals um, are responsible for my success in terms of planting the seeds for me to work hard, never complain. I mean, I had to come home every night after workouts, really hard workouts. I had to come home to John Vidmar, who never complained about his <laughs> physical challenges. So uh, nothing I could do about it but just be happy like my father was. And I think it really had a profound influence on my training. So you were uh, competing at UCLA. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Was that in the early 80s? And um, then... Yeah, I competed. Um, uh, I, I, I started in 1979. In 1980, I made my first Olympic team, um, that, but that was the year that the United States team uh, boycotted the Olympic Games because the Soviet Union at the time had invaded Afghanistan, and the U.S. President uh, Jimmy Carter announced that we would not be competing in Moscow at the Olympic Games because they were hosting the Games. So I made the team but didn't get to compete. Um, I was disappointed, and as all of the athletes were, but it didn't affect me as adversely as other athletes who maybe that was their only Olympic team or they were at the end of their career. I was kind of still in the early stages of my, of my career. I knew I'd be better four years later. And fortunately, I, I was healthy and, um, and was able to make the 1984 Olympic team. Along with two of my Olympic, uh, pardon me, two of my UCLA teammates, so Mitch Gaylord and Tim Daggett and myself were three of the six-man team. And so here we were competing, not just in our own country, but in our home city and in our home court because UCLA's arena, Poly Pavilion, was the host arena oh, wow. for gymnastics. So it really was the ideal situation for me. Well, back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. You started when you were 11. Mm -hmm. Where did the drive come to be an Olympian? That's a huge belief and commitment and uh, time. <laughs> I would say, you know, I, I think that um, we, we tend we tend to focus on the things we think will be fulfilling in our lives, for better and for worse. You know, sometimes we make mistakes thinking that going this way is going to be fun and it's, we find out it's not. But for me, when it came to sports, um, I, I had, uh, I crossed paths with a man that had been an Olympian, two-time Olympian. And so instead of telling me to work hard or pay attention, he would just fill my head with stories. And, and I'll give you just a couple examples. I, was, I remember when I was first training and I remember tearing a blister in my hand. We've all torn blisters working in the yard or playing on the bars at school and, and it just stung, like just, just a blow on it. And I remember, you know, I'm 11 years old and I said, oh, I just tore a blister. And he'd look at me and say, wow, does it hurt? And I'd say, yeah, it hurts. He goes, oh, did I ever tell you the time I was competing at the national championships? And I was on the rings and it was in New York, and as I swung through the bottom, I could feel my hands tear from the palm all the way up, both hands. And I said, both hands? He said, yeah. I said, did it hurt? He said, yeah, it hurt. What did you do? Well, I held on, and I won. And he'd walk away. And I'd sit there and look at my little torn blister, get up there and try not to complain and try a little hard. I remember being on the horizontal bar getting ready for my very first competition. It was the end of a long workout, and I was tired. I could barely hold on to the bar. And I thought, I'm going to just peel off this high bar. 
I said, Michael, I came in one of the bar. I'm so tired. Is this your tired? They said, yeah. Huh. Did I ever tell you about the Kavitska brothers from Poland? I said, no. What about the brothers from Poland? And he said, yeah. There were two brothers on the same team from Poland. And I remember at the World Championships in 1966, I shook one of their hands. And I looked down after shaking his hand. I noticed he only had three fingers on one hand. And he was a great high bar man. And then my coach would walk away. And I'd count one, two, three, four, five, and I'd get up and try harder. And so he filled my head with stories of the Olympic Games or the World Championships. He filled my head with expectations. Not He would never say if, he'd only say when. You know, when you make an Olympic team, um, when you make the national team, this is what you'll see, this is what you'll experience. It was never if. And so for me, it was kind of a, I learned to have expectations that came not just from him, but but expectations that I had for myself. But I knew that in order to accomplish that, I had to put in the work. And my coach taught me how to put in the work. So I really was blessed to have a, you know, a father that, that set an example for me, never complaining. I had a coach that had wisdom, techni technical wisdom, and, and, and great motivational wisdom to keep me you know, focused on a task. And you know, I, I, in a way, it was unfair. To other athletes, because I felt like I had the perfect situation for me. For me. And you want to be able to teach and be motivated in the yeah. future. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things you're famous for saying is don't sacrifice what you want most mm -hmm. up for what you want now. Yeah. now. How has that helped you throughout your life? You know, I think it applies to just about everything in life. And when, when I was in your shoes and when I was uh, trying to, to guide uh, our, our, our missionaries in the mission, I, I would share that quite a bit with them. Um, if I go back to my gymnastics years, well, what I wanted, um, what I wanted now on a Saturday I, was to go ride my Schwinn Stingray out in the fields with my buddies from my elementary school. What I wanted most was to be an Olympian, so I had to make a choice. What am I going to do now that's going to help me to be an Olympian? Well, I gotta go to the gym and I gotta train. I can't get on my bicycle and go playing with my friends. Um, and so I learned that kind of sacrifice then. Uh, I think it applies to even to you know later in life in education, right? We, we wanna go have fun at school, you're in college and there's so much to experience. I, I never went to a UCLA football game. She did, <laughs> but I had trainings on Saturdays and I never went until after I retired from gymnastics. Then I would go to the UCLA football games because I had to train. I think it's the same is true with finances. I would tell our missionaries, for example, you know, save your money. Maybe what you want now is to buy this item or that item, but what you want most maybe is to prepare for maybe having a home for your family or, or saving for your future. And so, so I think it's a it's 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 a it's a principle that if I really internalize it, and I've made plenty of mistakes where I compromised in my life, but there I've tried to focus on on that, and I think it's, it's paid off in, in, in terms of my life in sports and such. That's the power of sacrifice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Based on how many hours a day were you training <laughs> at the point where you started to yeah. be on the Olympic team? It, it was four to six hours a day, uh, never before, um, and often six. And um, I would do a morning training every morning. I'd do a run, a little mini workout, and then I would have my main workout, which would be four to six hours. And I trained Monday through Saturday. I always took Sabbath off and took Sundays off. Um, but um, I didn't take a vacation. We, we had a three-day honeymoon because <laughs> my coach is such a nice guy. <laughs> He's a great guy. And, um, and then uh, I think I took, I took Christmas Day off. Um, and maybe another 20 days total in about a 10-year period. But it was my choice. I, I chose it. It was my, I, I, want, I really wanted to be the best I could be. And so that was my choice. And so my parents would go on a vacation and they arranged for some of maybe, maybe a young couple in our church that would come and stay in our home for the week that my parents were gone so that they could take me to the gym. So then tell us, what was it like to achieve the gold medal after all of that? Well, yeah. take, take us up yeah. to that point, building up to that Olympics. And... You know, I, um, as I said, my coach filled my head with all these stories and all of the, the Olympics, and I wanted to have those experiences myself. And I, I competed in a number of world championships, which are actually bigger in numbers than the Olympic Games because they only have a limited number of teams that can compete at the Games. Um, but they all qualify at the world championships. So you'll have many more gymnasts at the world championships. And those are huge events. So I was in Moscow, in um, Hungary, 
Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, and those prepared me, I think, for that high level of international competition. Um, and I, I, I really felt that the last year of my training, things are really falling into place. I really felt, and I had I had success internationally, but I really felt great leading up to the, the 84 Olympics. And I'll never forget when my coach, at the end of one of my workouts, who, uh, he never gave me, uh, he never told me something unless he really firmly believed I could accomplish it. And I learned over the years to trust him with that. But right before the games, he said, hey, Peter, I just want you to know that you look really good right now. And I really believe you could become the Olympic All-Around Champion. And I dutifully nodded my head and said, uh-huh. But on the drive home after he said that, I was almost angry. Why would he say that to me? I mean, does that mean he expects me to be the Olympic All-Around Champion? I mean, this is number one. I've been top ten in the world, but number one? I mean, come on, Marco. And I remember just, why would he say that? And, and so I kind of shelved that, and I just went back to my training. And I'll never forget after the first uh, day of competition, um, after the compulsory round of competition, we, we had a great competition that first day as the U.S. team. You know, we, we really hit all of our routines for the most part. It was, and my, the alternate, Jimmy Mike, is from the University of Nebraska, leans into my ear as I'm putting my shoes on to march out. He says, Pete, I don't know if you want to know this, but you're in first place in the all-round right now. <laughs> I, I thought... Oh, why didn't I believe my coach when he told me that two months ago, three months ago? I ended up getting the silver medal in the all-around. I lost by 25 one thousandths of a point, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but to know that I was that close, and, uh, um, and I, it just gave me even that much more respect for my coach, to have that kind of um, wherewithal and that faith and that presence of mind and that awareness of my level of, of ability at the time to, to give me that little boost, and I'm grateful for that. So no regrets there, none whatsoever. So, and, I, and I went on to win some other medals on the so. <laughs> That was when you won the gold of the Palm, Palm, Palm Horse. Palm yeah. And I really wanted to win that because I wanted my coach to say um, that he coached an Olympic champion. I really wanted it for him. And so when I saw the 10 flash and I won the gold medal, I was grateful um, that my coach could say he coached an Olympic champion. Can you walk us through that event a little bit? Yeah. Was running through your mind as you're preparing and performing and... Well, in, going into the finals in the Palm Wars, I was tied for first place with Li Ning of China, who was their greatest gymnast. Like, Li Ning developed the, the Li Ning line of clothing is like the Nike of China. It's a, he's a billionaire. She wants to know what my problem is in business, but I mean, <laughs> he's, he was, uh, he's a very famous uh, individual in China. Um, but um, Li Ning and I were tied for first place, and so in the finals, Li Ning went up right before me and he scored a perfect 10. I'm pretty good at math, so I knew that to tie him for the gold medal, I had to score a perfect 10. So any mistake, and I would lose the gold medal. And my knee bent, my toe overlapped the other toe. So I knew going into it that, it, that in, at least in the judge's eyes, that the performance had to be perfect. And so you can imagine that with that in mind, you know, there's going to be a little extra effort to keep those legs straight, those toes pointed, so that there's no mistakes. The judges can't see any mistake. That's my goal. Well, extra effort requires an extra expenditure of energy. And so I started to fatigue a little bit earlier towards the end of that performance. I had kind of, a, at least in those days, for me it was a very difficult dismount sequence that I kind of had kind of put together. And I figured the judges would be expecting me to do that. But I could feel that burning fatigue in my stomach. And I thought, what am I going to do? If I, if, I, if I can't make this dismount successfully, I'm going to fall off this palm horse. I won't win any medal at all. Forget the goal. And then I thought, well, if I take it easy and do an easier dismount, I could, um, I could, uh, I could guarantee a medal right now. But it won't be gold because the judges are going to know that I watered down my routine, and I, and so I had to make a decision. Now this this debate raging through my mind probably lasted about a second. It's amazing how you can process information under pressure. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, no, Peter, you do what you trained to do. And so I went for that harder dismount sequence and. Maybe the knowledge that I had to make, it gave me a little extra adrenaline boost, and I made it successfully, and I just wasn't sure if it was enough. So I emotionally resigned myself to the silver medal when I got off the bomb horse. And um, I have the video broadcast that my kids have seen, and they just fall over laughing at it, because the, the 10 flashes in the corner of my eye, and my reaction is comical. 
this talk. Oh my goodness, I thought you looked so stupid. Let me rewind it. <laughs> so, um, so I, uh, uh, and so I, and that was just elation, elation. I think the most, the most uh, meaningful experience though was the team gold medal. When we got up on the victory stand with, with the team, these are five other guys that I shared a dream with, and we lived a life together with in our training and preparation. And, um, and uh, that's when all of a sudden they realized, you know what, um, all that hard work did pay off. Um, and that even if we hadn't won, it still paid off. There's so many things you learn from participating in sports or anything, music, any skill, that when you put that effort in something um, and you're able to perform at your capacity, um, it's just a really um, satisfying feeling to know that you went out there and you gave it your best shot. That's, that was the best part about it. Donna, Donna, were you there? I was there. What was that like to watch? It was, it was amazing. I mean, I, wor I worked for the, um, the production company that did this uh, 16 Days of War. Yeah. And um, the official film. The official of the film of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And so I had worked on that in the year building up to the Olympics. And when it came time for the Olympics, they just put me on camera position right on the floor. And I just watched from there. And um, and it was it was amazing. It was it was really I mean, you know, I can't even describe it. It was it was just incredible. But because I was a gymnast and we were trained together and did everything together, I I felt like I could relate more to him and what was going on. But now that I have a daughter who competed at, um, at BYU in gymnastics, and then I have a daughter who also ran track and field, and then my boys were wrestlers, being a parent, I can't comprehend how his parents did it. It's way worse to be a parent than it is being a wife. I, I, I don't know. So it was, it was an amazing experience. But yeah. What was your reaction when you saw the 10? Oh, <laughs> I, they're probably happy on film somewhere. She, she, knew, she knew I needed it. I mean, she, I she, 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 could, she could do her math as easily as any gymnast out there. Yeah, so. we, back in the day when it used to be really easy because it only went to 10, it was easy to figure it out. Now, now the scoring is beyond 10, so it's a little more complicated. It's a little more complicated, but yeah, we knew exactly what they needed to, yeah. to win. Or, and so, yeah, it was pure relation that he did it. It was awesome. And a long time ago. And a long time ago. <laughs> Well, it's really fun to watch. I think that everyone will take a moment to watch that performance. Um, was there any doubts along the way? How did you overcome? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I always loved the sport. I loved doing it. I loved going to the gym every day. But I remember about, I think it was my sophomore year in college, I was competing for UCLA, so we would have to meet every weekend. And I was competing for the United States team. So I was traveling internationally and competing domestically. And going to school. And going to school. And I remember coming back from an international event about a week before final exams. And I was panicked because I missed probably half of the semester. M missed my classes and, and such. And, and I was responsible for all the material and all the finals. And I remember feeling the stress, of course, the academic stress. And, having to go through that, and so I was burned out. And now all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, going to the gym wasn't fun. I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought, does this mean I don't have it anymore? Does this mean I won't be able to you know, be the gymnast that I was hoping to be? And then I just remember doing an evaluation of what my goals were. My goals hadn't changed. I still wanted to make another Olympic team. I still wanted to you know, win a national championship and this and that. So the goals were still there. I just needed to kind of reset. And, um, and I could have just said, well, I'm going to take a break and just stop doing gymnastics for a while. Or I could just go to the gym and just do my job. And that's what I chose to do. And eventually, when the you know, finals were over, I got through, got through you know, that semester. And, um, and then the, the fire kind of came back. And, and that was really the first time I ever confronted burnout, which every athlete experiences. But I, I, I experienced it kind of late. Um, and yet, um, I was on fire all the way up until the games so. I think they did great in school because I was in class with them and I gave them my notes. <laughs> and that's a better grade in the class. And, oh, that wasn't fair. It's <laughs> not fair. We have a couple of questions yeah. coming in. Yeah, Here, here's one we'll ask. Um, so, obviously, with winning a gold medal mm -hmm. in the United States, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're now a celebrity. Kind of. Yeah. And <laughs> one, of the, one of the, uh, well, the question was, do you remember when you were on Johnny Carson? I I'm do. sure you remember that. So. <laughs> I did actually. Um, so I was on The Tonight Show, 
Uh, and, uh, and, and Johnny was actually, I think, taking the time off to watch the Olympics or go on vacation okay. or whatever. So Joan Rivers was the host of the Tonight Show. <laughs> so the older folks will know who Joan Rivers was. And I um, thought, wow, she can be, she could be tough on, inter uh, on people, but she, she was really touched by the whole Olympic experience there. And it was in Los Angeles. They taped the show in LA. So I was on that Tonight Show while the games were still going on. Okay. So I finished competing, but there's still another week of competition left because gymnastics was the first week of the games. And so here I was on the show, and so I brought a USA warm-up suit to her and, uh, and gave her a gift. She cried. She said she gave me she gave these flowers to your wife, you know. And so and I, did a, I did a little exhibition, and, um, you know, um, they had a pair of bars out there, and I did a little exhibition for the audience. And, yeah, it was fun. I mean, you have that little brief little 15 minutes of fame and it's over. I wasn't, I wouldn't consider myself famous, but I had a... I for about know. a month, we didn't buy a meal. Yeah. Exactly. Every, every restaurant you went to, someone will recognize you and say, well, they offered to pay your meal. So we kept working away for Spreadley Hills. It <laughs> 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 yeah, was great. It was fun. It was a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> so fun. Um, another question here. How well did you know Mary Lou Retton? Oh. Mary Lou Retton was a, is, is a very, to this day, is a very good friend of mine. And I don't talk to her very often, but uh, we still, you know, occasionally we'd see each other and um, we, we'd done a lot of different events together, for example. A wonderful person, a, 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 a very um, faithful Christian um, mother of uh, four daughters, all very athletic and competitive in gymnastics and um, um, just uh, just a great community. Just, uh, I really appreciate my, my friendship with her. I haven't talked to her very much. I think I spoke to her maybe about eight months ago, and that was probably the last time. We hadn't spoken in a few years. I've been busy with our mission and all that. But, uh, yeah, she's a great athlete, great gymnast. Now, that's a famous gymnast. If you want to talk about fame and gymnastics, she, got, she, she deserved it. She deserved it. Oh, that's so great. How about, um, did you ever coach? Or did you coach? You know, I volunteer coached at the club that our boys um, trained at when they were doing gymnastics. I didn't, I never took on a full-time assignment or, you know, a position because I just wasn't sure if they were going to stay with gymnastics. And they did for a while, and so I would go to workouts with them and have, and have fun with them. And then, and then they uh, shifted to other things and got into wrestling and all that. My daughter, our, our daughter was probably the most competitive. I mean, she competed at a, at a high level and, and was very serious, trained long hours. But in, in many aspects, women's gymnastics and men's gymnastics are different sports. And there are plenty of coaches in Southern California that have much better coaching skills to coach her daughter than, than me. So I never coached her ever. Maybe that's why she went out to compete so well in college. But, um, <laughs> but uh, my boys uh, switched, shifted over to, uh, two of our sons shifted over to wrestling. They were, they were very good high school wrestlers. And, um, and then um, our daughter decided to be a runner. And she, I don't know where that came from, but she ended up competing at the BYU, which is a terrific track and field program. So. Now, did you have a favorite event? Well, I would say Paul Morris was kind of my favorite. I had a knack for Paul Morris. I also liked Horizontal Bar. I really enjoyed Horizontal Bar. Um, it's kind of the, kind of the more, uh, I would say, acrobatic event, and uh, I had success there in, in competitions on the high bar. I was, uh, um, in the Olympics, I, was, I made it to the finals. Uh, so I was seventh on floor, I was first on horse, fourth on wings, fourth on horizontal bar, and I was fourth in qualifying on parallel bars, but there were two Americans ahead of me, and they only had two per country rule in the finals. So I had a very good, well-rounded Olympic Games. I was seventh, I, I, was, I think it was like 20th on the vault, so I had a good score, but a lot of guys did a little better on the vault. That was my weakest event. I think my most satisfying personal accomplishment at the Olympics was seventh place on floor because it was a very difficult event for me. I didn't have super powerful, strong legs. And um, as a result, I, um, I struggled in that event, as well as the vault. And I was able to bring that, that performance level up the last year of my career, where I think I won the national championship on floor, and then I made it to the finals in the Olympics on floor. And that was very satisfying to the spectator. It's just, you know, you didn't win a medal. But, but to me, it was, it was, it's, it's valuable to me as the gold medal. Um, so. Don, how about you? What's your favorites? At the time, it was probably the uneven parallel bars. But back in the day when I did gymnastics, it was 
completely different event. It's when the bars were closer together and you used to wrap your body around the bars. Mm -hmm. And it was my senior year at UCLA when they just started, women started doing giants. And, they and now the bars are way far apart and yeah. they do different pieces of apparatus. It's way <laughs> later. But at the time, it's, it's a fun event. So you've seen quite an evolution in the last Yeah, we're both glad we don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> what advice would you give to young athletes, gymnasts in particular, perhaps? Well, first, you know, I think to, you, you got to love what you do. You know, you got to find out what's the reason why you're doing it. And a lot, sometimes there's lots of different influences. You know, we've got, um, there's parental influence, there's peer influences in life. Um, but in the end, you've got to be the one, uh, you, you've got to be the one that's committed yourself. You have to own your own goals. And that's, I think, a principle in life, to be successful. If, if we're doing it for the wrong reasons, we probably will. When we get to that point where we, have, where we can exercise our agency and, and we're on our own, we'll, we'll tend to drift up away from that unless we love it. And so you got to love it and then find joy in the journey, not in the result. The results will almost never be exactly what you want. They'll never be exactly what you want, but but um, most of them. I, I had far more failures than I had successes. And so I found satisfaction in just trying to improve a skill, improve a certain aspect of my performance. And, um, and, and, but you gotta love what you do. And, and if you do, you'll work hard. You'll work hard. So what part has Jesus Christ played in your life? And all of this experience you've had, what part has he been? You know, it's interesting. I, um, I've, always, I've always had faith. I've always um, um, had a deep belief in my Savior. I uh, certainly, wh what I've learned about myself in my weaknesses is we tend to pray a little more sincerely when we want something badly. And, and how can I be sincere um, and fervent in my prayers when things are going well? Um, am I, and, and so we, we tend to, I think, uh, wear on our knees praying when we want something. And, I, and so I would catch myself as an athlete. You know, first of all, is, is it really that important, a sport, when there's so many issues that we see in the world? I mean, I'm very focused on my little world of, of gymnastics. And is there a bigger picture that I need to make sure that I keep track of in my life? And I think as time has gone on, I've, 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 my, my horizons have expanded with regard to that, thankfully so. Um, but I remember, um, I remember, I was so grateful. My, my overwhelming emotion on the victory stand was out of gratitude. I was so grateful to my Heavenly Father for placing in my path a, a father that was an example of me, a coach that, that was the best coach I could have possibly had, uh, teammates that were motivating, that were, that were great people. I mean, I, so I remember on the victory stand just thinking, I'm so grateful, so grateful. So now we get ushered into the the, to the press conference, and I thought, okay, so how grateful am I? You know, am I gonna um, just answer the technical questions about my performance? And the first question that was put to me in this room filled with reports from all over the world, I said, before I answer your question, I said, I want everyone to know how thankful I am to God for um, blessing me with the opportunity to have this experience and to, and, and to, do, um, to do what we just did tonight. This is right after we won the team gold medal. And I found these, and I found these words naturally. Coming. I was so grateful. I need to be public about it, right? And don't light a candle and put it under a bushel, right? Just, so I wanted to show my gratitude to the Lord. Um, it's interesting because there was a reporter from Los Angeles, a sports reporter that I'd known for years, who I didn't know was a, a, a devout Christian man. And, and when the when the whole press conference was over, we're getting ushered into the bus to go somewhere else. He grabs me by the hand and pulls me and says, "Thank you." Or expressing your faith. He says, it's not done enough. So when I see athletes on television now, and they express their faith and their gratitude to God and, to, and, and their faith in the Savior, regardless of, of, of their specific denomination, I, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to see that, that in a world that's kind of pushing uh, faith off to the side so often, that there's still those out there that say, you know what, I believe, and I'm grateful, and I acknowledge the Savior in my life. And I hope to do that to my dying breath, because I am grateful. Ron, do you want to add on to share about your faith? Well, I am, I am grateful um, for the decision that I made 40 some odd years ago, because 42 years ago, because I think of the trajectory that my life has taken. And 
I am grateful for our Savior who has led me in the decisions that um, have helped me to to be who I am and to raise my family and to just have the knowledge that, that we have a Heavenly Father that loves us and a Savior who knows us personally. And I'm super grateful for that. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints provides for me to be closer to the Savior. It's really, it's a vehicle to bring us closer to Jesus Christ. And um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, there, there's four pillars to our, our life in the church. And I, if there's four words to remember, it's live, care, invite, and unite. And that, those are four words that we that we try to teach our youth in the church is to live live according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Try to, try to, try to live the way that you live. And the other three, um, while, while the first one kind of points inwardly, the other three are kind of outward. Um, care for the poor and the needy. Care for those that have struggles in their lives. Be aware of them. And, 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 and don't just pray for them, but ask Heavenly Father, what can I do, what can I do specifically to help someone near me or, or away from me on the other side of the globe? Right? Uh, and then um, invite others to come into Christ. Invite others to have that joy that comes from the Savior. And then we believe that families can be together forever, so we want to unite families for eternity. And we do wonderful work in the temple that enables families to be together. These ordinances that we perform are sacred, and we do it simply because of love. Love for the Savior and love for our family and love for our fellow man. And in the end, it's really all about love, the, the most overriding, most important principle in, in the universe. And I'm grateful for that. Very grateful. Thank you. Tell us what you're doing. Well, um, we came up here uh, from California after the mission to, uh, and I, I kind of retired. I now, uh, I work for a financial institution now, but I, I was retired and I, um, there's only so much, you, so many times you clean out your garage, you know, and I, um, we, we, we came up here and we enjoyed the recreation of Utah. We love to ski, I love the mountain bike. Um, I have, I'm very blessed to serve on the General Young Men's Advisory Council in the church. Um, and uh, which um, helps to administer the, the children youth program, the youth program for, for young men ages 12 to 18. Um, in, in my day and the day of my, my sons, we had scouting, and now we have a new program. And it's, it's specifically driven to bring um, our young people closer to our Savior. That's the purpose of that. And I have the opportunity to train um, uh, different uh, groups in our church all, all throughout North America uh, on Zoom calls every week uh, training and I, I love doing it. Um, it's, it's, it's helped me, this work alone has helped me get even closer to the Savior and I work with some remarkable faithful uh, men and women uh, in, in the Alumns organization as well. It's been just a great blessing. I, I enjoy it so much. I also, um, I, I would say that, and, and I think you'll find this in your lives, is uh, it's, it's just you uh, uh, preside over a mission in the churches that, you, that these the missionaries that you serve with will be a part of your life forever. And we, we there's probably not a day that goes by that I'm not texting or calling or speaking with or meeting with one of our missionaries. And and it could be a, a it could be a phone call with technology that's so easy to access with a missionary in Samoa or Tonga or Kiribati or in. Um, Europe or in Asia, uh, all over the world, and it happens almost daily, and it's a great blessing. I feel like our family, which is very close, has expanded uh, beyond just our immediate family to these wonderful, wonderful men and women that, that we've been able to serve with and to share our love for the Savior with. What's your basis just a priceless? Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been wonderful. We do need to know if you still oh, yeah. do pommel horse or you know I, 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 I perform on the pommel horse at events up until age 52 oh, wow. I'm 62 now so I'm about a decade removed from that I exercise every day uh, but mostly it's mountain biking and snow skiing in the winter and running and um, things like that that don't involve going upside down as much but I do have a good handstand I keep my handstands up so I would always challenge my missionaries uh, to handstand contests. Well, they would challenge me. I would not go out and I would challenge them, but if, if they wanted to, then it's fair to me. But I, I wish we could ask to see what yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is really wonderful. We really appreciate it. I have to tell you, Peter, I was a young 17-year-old 
young man when you spoke at the general priesthood conference session for the Church of Jesus Christ of the Saints about the pursuit of excellence. And that, that I was just getting ready for my own personal going on a mission myself about that time. Thank you. And I really have found it. That was an incredible experience. Yeah. So thank you for that. I'm sure that I speak for a lot of young men who you, you've influenced and continue on. So thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you for joining us for Why I Believe on My Road to Open Peace. Uh, look uh, on My Road to Open Peace coming up for more Why I Believe episodes. Um, we know that uh, artist Dan Wilson is going to join us in November, but we hope to have one in October as well. So thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. Bye.